Hey guys, if you were with us on day one of our 15 day road trip, you might remember that I talked a little bit about this guy. The guy who wrote this book. Well, Albert O'Curl was also the guy who bought the town of Amboy. You know, that place out in the middle of the Mojave Desert that has that big, giant, cool neon sign. That place that says Roy's Motel and Cafe. Well, even before he bought the town of Amboy, he actually started a couple of museums in San Bernardino. And we want to go out there and visit them. One of those places was the unofficial McDonald's Museum. It's the museum that sits on the very spot where the first McDonald's was. We want to go out and visit that place because we missed a couple of spots in San Bernardino. So, you want to come with us? Well, let's go. San Bernardino is about an hour and a half away, but that's only if you go the quickest way. And you know us, I've always said, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And that's usually true for us, but this isn't really a road trip. It's just a day trip, so we do kind of want to get where we're going but even so i'm not a big fan of southern california freeways so once we got a little bit past pasadena we got off of the freeway and on to you guessed it route 66 where we drove through monrovia then duarte then came to azusa which is a place where someone thought hey this place is like a to z usa so they shortened that to azusa and that's how the city got its name. So as we drove through Azusa in the rain, we saw this fabulous old drive-in marquee. I didn't know much about this sign, but I knew I had seen it somewhere. Turns out it was in this book. These Arcadia publishing books are the best references on local history for just about anywhere in the U.S., in my opinion. Anyway, when we saw this sign, I couldn't really slow down to get a better shot, so I decided to turn around. So we turned around because I wanted to get a better shot of this. The Foothill Drive-In opened in 1961 during a time when drive-ins were extremely popular. During its later years, like so many drive-ins, it was used for swap meets until its ultimate demise in 2001. The land was then purchased by Azusa Pacific University and, after much negotiation with the city about what they could and couldn't do with the land, the university agreed it would refurbish and maintain the sign and the land would become a parking lot for students and faculty. When APU purchased the land, the plan was to build more than just a parking lot and the sign was going to be bulldozed along with everything else. The city didn't even care about what happened, so it wasn't until the California Historical Resources Commission stepped in and at least saved the sign. So APU agreed to restore and maintain the sign in exchange for their parking lot. Personally, I'm all for progress, but when it comes at the expense of completely neglecting history and heritage, sometimes that cost is just too high, so I'm thankful that the commission stepped in and at least we can all enjoy a little reminiscing when we drive by sites like this. As we continue our drive through Azusa and into Glendora, as we make our way to our next stop, which happens to be a place where we stopped during our 15-day excursion over the summer, we could probably do without the sugar, but this place was so good, we just couldn't resist the temptation. Well, we said we were going to visit places that we had not come to on our last video, but I lied. 
Yeah, I'm talking about the Donut Man, of course. This icon of Glendora has only been around since 1973, but not only is it a local favorite, it has become a Route 66 must-stop for just about anyone making their way down the main street of America. I'm not going to get into the history too much since I told you all about it in our video about day one of our 15-day road trip, so if you missed that that video, I hope you'll go back and check it out. Yummy! <laughs> now it's time to get back on the road towards our next destination. To get there, we'll stay on Foothill Boulevard, also known as Route 66 at this stretch. So we travel through Glendora, then through San Dimas, then Laverne, then Claremont before reaching the city of Upland, California. Here is where we'll find a landmark we missed during our 15-day road trip, but this is something we really wanted to see in person, so we made it a point of getting here on this trip. So we're coming up on the corner of Euclid and Foothill on Route 66 and we're going to take a look at the Madonna of the Trail. Are you there? The Madonna of the Trail is one of 12 identical statues along the National Old Trails Road, which extends from Baltimore, Maryland, all the way to Los Angeles, California. Much of the road later became a part of Route 66. This statue, which was erected in 1929, is one of two on Route 66, with the other being in Albuquerque, New Mexico. All of the statues were commissioned by a group known as the Daughters of the Revolution, an organization which is still very active today. To be a member, all you need to do is show proof that you are a direct descendant of a person or persons directly involved in the American Revolution. The Madonna of the Trail is a representation of the pioneer woman determined to make her way across long hard trails heading west in search of a better life for herself and her family. She is clad in homespun clothes, carrying her baby and a rifle as her son walks alongside, clutching her dress in an effort to stay close. In the words of Mrs. John Trigg Moss, the woman who first conceived of the idea of the monuments, she is the face of the mother, strong in character, beauty, and gentleness. She is the face of a mother who realizes her responsibilities and trusts wholly in God. Only a few years ago, when there were riots across the U.S. as statues of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and even Abraham Lincoln were being torn down for, in my opinion, absolutely absurd reasons, several of the Madonna of the Trail statues were also threatened. Thankfully, they all survived. On this day, as Annette and I walked around the statue checking out all the details, I couldn't help but notice dozens of pedestrians and hundreds of cars just passing right on by. I couldn't help but wonder how many knew the significance of this magnificent monument. Now we're going to hop on the freeway to make our way to the next stop. And now, once again, it's time to get back on the road. During our 15-day excursion, we pretty much saw what we wanted to see in Rialto and Rancho Cucamonga, and I wouldn't mind seeing some of those sites again and spending even more time there, but we've only got one day this time, and we really wanted to see the few of the sites that we missed in San Bernardino, so we decided to get off of the Mother Road, skip right past those places, and as much as I hate it, take the freeway to save us a little bit of time. And now we come to the main reason we came all the way out here, the unofficial McDonald's Museum. 
As you might remember, I became a big fan of Mr. Albert Okura when I learned that he was the dude who purchased the town of Amboy on Route 66. Many years before that, he started a chain of chicken restaurants called Juan Pollo, which has its headquarters right here in San Bernardino. In fact, this very property where the McDonald's Museum sits was the headquarters for the restaurant chain. Mr. Okura grew up loving McDonald's. As a child, he would often ride his bicycle long distances to spend whatever cash he had earned to get his feel of McDonald's. So, in 1998, while in search of much-needed real estate to house his company's headquarters, he knew it was his fate to buy this place when he learned the property was in foreclosure. But before we get into that, let's back up about 50 years. In 1937, Dick and Mac McDonald opened their first restaurant in Monrovia, California, where they would sell hot dogs, orange juice, and coffee and tea. That place, with its unusual design known as the Airdrome, would, in 1940, be physically moved to this spot, 14th and E Street, in San Bernardino, where Dick and Mac changed the name and opened the very first McDonald's restaurant. It included 20 attractive car hops and a menu that consisted of barbecue ribs, beef, and pork sandwiches. McDonald's barbecue became the number one teen hangout in the area, but running an operation that catered to unruly teenagers began to wear on the McDonald's brothers. Realizing that 80% of their sales were burgers and fries, the brothers took a huge risk, closed down the restaurant for remodeling, and changed the menu entirely. So, in 1948, in order to cater to the GIs returning home from World War II who were just starting families, McDonald's reopened with what became their signature speedy service system and a menu that mainly featured featured 15 cent burgers and 10 cent fries. It actually took a couple of years for Speedy to catch on, but we all know it did. So now it's 1953, the brothers decided on yet another remodel. This one included the addition of the iconic golden arches on the building and the golden arch sign, which also became the McDonald's logo. Now let's talk a little bit about Ray Kroc. He was a multi-mixer salesman out of Chicago who was very driven and he noticed that the McDonald's brothers were ordering a ton of mixers and all the parts needed to maintain those mixers so Ray figured these guys must be selling milkshakes left and right so in 1955 Ray Kroc convinced the brothers to let him franchise and he opened a McDonald's in Des Plaines Illinois and even though that would actually be the fifth McDonald's to open Ray Kroc decided that it was the first and he tagged it that way and that is now the official McDonald's Museum there's a lot more to this story, and I could talk all day about it, but if you want to know more about this story, you can check out the movie called The Founder, starring Michael Keaton as Ray Kroc, on Amazon Prime or Netflix. The building with the original Golden Arches, the one the brothers built in 1953, was torn down in 1972, but a concerned neighbor somehow convinced the wrecking crew to leave the original Golden Arch sign. So that sign you see as you drive up to the museum is original, and not only that, it's unrestored, so it's exactly how it was left when Dick and Mac McDonald walked away from the business they had started. The building you see here was constructed in 1980. It was first occupied by Lopez Music. Then, in 1992, the San Bernardino Civic Light Opera bought the building to house their operations. But the debt was just too great for the opera to handle, so in 1998, the property went into foreclosure. And that's when fate hit Albert Okura. He found out about the foreclosure and immediately made an offer of $135,000, which was promptly accepted. 
Mr. Okura immediately moved his company's headquarters into the building in the back, and on December the 12th of that year, exactly 50 years to the day after the first McDonald's opened on this spot, he opened the unofficial McDonald's museum you see here. We were incredibly fortunate to have met and spent time with the museum's curator, Mr. Jack Marcus. Besides being the curator, Jack worked for and was very close to Albert and the entire Okura family. He was also part of the crew that started in putting the town of Amboy back into shape so Route 66 travelers would have one of the best places to stop on the entire Mother Road. He didn't want his picture taken, which to me, would have been nice but i also understood and i wanted to honor his wishes in that regard but we did get to speak with him a lot and believe me jack had a plethora of stories that we thoroughly enjoyed hearing so we felt very honored to have met him as you exit the McDonald's Museum and turn directly right, to the south, right next door, you come to the Inland Empire Military Museum. This museum is yet another way Albert Okura is giving back to his community. The property is owned by the Juan Pollo Restaurant Company, opening in 2004 with the help of the museum's curator, Mr. Mario Montesino, who also happens to be a Vietnam veteran. Their hours are pretty limited. They're only open on Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 5, but if you're able to go, you'll most likely catch Mario there, and he'll be more than happy to give you a complete rundown of everything you see in the place. Something I found out well after our visit is that much of the memorabilia you see is from Mario's personal collection. And not only that, Mario was also the MC of the San Bernardino's annual Veterans Day Parade and Car Show, which is sponsored by, you guessed it, the Juan Pollo Restaurant Company, who also, of course, participates in the parade. It's amazing to me that a Japanese descendant whose family was treated so miserably during World World War II and is someone who has every right to complain, instead has done so much to honor and preserve history, not only the history of Route 66, but also of this country and the men and women who have served to protect it. During our visit to this museum, there were at least five docents, all veterans of different branches of the military in all ages, and everyone we talked to was extremely friendly and welcoming. We felt as though they were truly happy we stopped in, and I'm sure they do that with every person that walks through the doors. The Inland Empire Military Museum, it's not a huge museum, but it's well worth a visit by anyone interested in history, especially military history. It seems pretty small at the outset, but it actually consists of two buildings, which are packed with items from both World Wars, the Korean War, Vietnam, and all the way through to Iraq and Afghanistan. There's a 1943 Jeep used in Korea, an incredible collection of uniforms, medals, fascinating old pictures, weapons, communications equipment, spy gear, specialized cameras, news articles, you name it. If it has anything to do with the military, whether in peacetime or war, they've got it here, covering all branches of military service. One of the sections that really, really piqued my interest was a special section dedicated to Albert Okura's father, Tsuyoshi, whose nickname was T, probably because Tsuyoshi is really hard to say. Anyway, T was in the Army when the U.S. officially entered World War II. He was stationed in Texas when all Japanese people in the U.S. were ordered into internment camps during the war. In Albert's book, he mentions this, but doesn't mention whether T was ordered to internment. Only that he never saw action, but briefly mentions T's brother, Susomo, who was part of the 442nd Infantry, a combat unit that was comprised solely of Japanese Americans. Albert's uncle, Susomo, was a true American hero. He lost his life fighting against the Germans during World War II in Italy. 
Well, now it's time to get back in the car and drive on down one of the old Route 66 alignments through San Bernardino. It's been about three hours since we had our fill of sugar and carbs at the Donut Man, and we're feeling kind of hungry. So where do we go for lunch? Well, about two and a half miles away to the original Juan Pollo, of course. I had brought Albert O'Curr's book along with us in hopes of maybe seeing one of Albert's sons so that maybe I could get them to sign it. As expected, though, neither of them were there. It was the weekend after all, but the book is chock full of pictures throughout, and as it turned out, many of the employees at the restaurant were in the book, so I asked if I could get them to sign it. The funny part was it seemed as though they had no idea they were in the book, so as they all gathered around to graciously sign it for me, you could tell they were having a lot of fun just browsing through the pictures and seeing themselves, and I'm sure people that maybe they had forgotten about or whatever. It was fun for Annette and I to watch them, as they obviously weren't used to having people ask them for their autographs. Now, while we were in San Bernardino, we wanted to make a few quick stops. We had seen some old pictures of classic Route 66 of a couple of places and wanted to see how they look now compared to when the pictures were taken. First up is the Oasis Motel. I actually didn't have any old photos or postcards, but I still found this place really interesting because in the 1960s, this motel was owned by Virginia Arness. She was the wife of actor James Arness, star of the popular TV series Gunsmoke. Mrs. Arness called this place a citadel of love, and it was a very popular spot for artisans. Now, not too far away, we find San Bernardino's finest motel. Well, maybe it was at one time. Now it's a place with residential rentals, and quite honestly, I didn't really have the warm and fuzzies about getting out of my car in this neighborhood. But still, it's kind of fun to see the comparison, don't you think? Our next stop is the beautiful California Theater. As most people know, one of the nicknames for Route 66 is the Will Rogers Highway. That's because Will Rogers, an American icon at the time, was hired as a spokesman for Route 66 when the route was first established. But on June 28, 1935, Will Rogers made his last public performance right here in this theater. Less than two months later, on August 15th, Will Rogers would lose his life in a plane crash in Alaska. This theater is still very much in operation today. We didn't get to go in and check it out, but I'm glad we at least got to see it from the outside and compare it to what it looked like back in the day. something that you'll see a lot of if you travel on Route 66. Train stations! And this is one I'm really glad we saw. All aboard! This Mission Revival style station officially opened in 1918 and seeing it in person is truly awe-inspiring. The previous station here in San Bernardino was a large wooden structure that was built in 1886 and burned down in 1916. So when the Atchison Topeka Santa Fe Railroad Company decided on what to build in its place, local politicians pressured the company to replace the old station was something big and elaborate so ATSF complied and boy did they ever they hired architect A.W. Moore and built this masterpiece for a cost of eight hundred thousand dollars the equivalent of around sixteen million in today's money at the time of its construction, it was by far the biggest railroad station west of the Mississippi River, and just a couple of years after opening the station, they added on to the structure so that the Fred Harvey Company could come in and open a Harvey House restaurant, which they would operate until the mid-1950s, when the Fred Harvey Company ceased operations and quit the hospitality industry altogether, an industry that basically was started by Fred Harvey. 
Harvey House Restaurants and Hotels, along with the famous Harvey Girls, is something that we talk a lot about on our travels, so be sure to check out some of our other videos, especially along Route 66, to learn more. It is truly a fascinating story. When this station first opened, both the Santa Fe Railroad and Union Pacific made regular stops in San Bernardino. The station was also used to service local streetcars run by Pacific Electric, which, besides its local transportation, it also included the Colton Line that would run between San Bernardino and the city of Colton, which is just a few miles southwest. Like most streetcars in most cities across the U.S., this form of local transportation was overshadowed by cars and buses, so the privately held Pacific Electric Streetcar Company would see Cease operations in 1942. Today, this station serves as an Amtrak hub as well as a station for Southern California's Metrolink commuter trains. The Harvey House has been remodeled and repurposed as offices for local government and transportation officials. The west side extension of the building now serves as the San Bernardino History and Railroad Museum with very limited hours. It's only open on Saturdays from 10 to 3, so of course, the museum wasn't open when we got there, so I guess now we've just got to come back, right? So now it's time to ride on off into the sunset. Literally. Oh my gosh, today was so much fun. I hope you enjoyed it too. Who would have thought that there was so much to do in, in San Bernardino? So many interesting things to see. That was incredible. Michael and I really hope that you join us again next time for our next adventure. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> Bye.